My name is Shannon Morgan, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a Bigfoot Case Files member today by clicking the join button below this video or on our YouTube channel page. Channel members get access to exclusive perks, including two weekly members-only videos with limited ads, monthly members-only giveaways with exclusive Bigfoot Case Files merchandise, and more. For a full list of all channel member perks, please see the membership tab on our channel page. As always, thank you for all of your support, and we hope to see you there. In August 1997, near Mescalero, in Otero County in New Mexico. In the first incident, two sisters were on their way to their mother's place to pick up children for a birthday party. As they turned onto the dirt gravel road to the house, they saw something sitting by the left side of the road. When the car lights illuminated it, it stood up to a height estimated to be seven feet or more. One of the sisters refused to look at it after one glance. It was reported that the eyes seemed red in the headlights. It was hairy all over, with kind of a pointed head, long arms, and it had no neck. It moved off towards the river. The sisters turned into their mother's driveway and did not see it again. They were very frightened and were sure it was not a bear or a human. This happened in March of 1997, as I recall. My husband and I were visiting our adopted family in August 1997, having arrived there on August 21st. We were in our pop-up camper, parked by the river, and behind the brush arbor across the driveway from Grandma's house. The next door to her house lives her son and his family. Her son was away on a fire, along with his son, but his wife and daughter were at home. On August 21st, we had set up our camp, ate, visited, and went to bed early, around 11 p.m. Everyone was asleep except me, and I was drifting into sleep, when I felt a very strong jolt to our camper, which made everything rattle. I thought it might be a horse or a cow, but the impact was higher than a horse or cow, like at the roof line. I was too scared to move, but I didn't know why. Nothing more happened. So I went to sleep and told my husband about it the next morning. He sleeps like a log. On Saturday, August 23rd, the whole group of us, maybe 20 people, had cooked and eaten outside and after cleanup, we all sat around the fire in the bush arbor, enjoying the cool evening and visiting with old friends. I was talking and way off somewhere, there was a sound like a crying baby. The little girl sitting next to me said, did you hear that? I responded that I didn't hear anything, and she said, that weird howl. Immediately, the adults stood up and told the children to go into the house and that it was time for bed. They all heard it, whatever it was. My husband and I and our two little granddaughters sat there for a short while, wondering what was going on, and then went to our trailer and went to sleep. The dogs barked and howled almost all night. The next morning, Sunday, August 24th, I woke up and went into the house for coffee. All of the family members were already there talking. I listened for a while, and the topic of conversation intrigued me, and so I asked what everyone was talking about. Dead silence. I jokingly said that it sounded to me like they were talking about Bigfoot. One, and then another one of them began to talk about it, and I said, why didn't you tell me? Their response was that they didn't want to scare us off. I told them that I had been interested in this for years. Then the stories came out, such as the first one cited herein. Two of the grandchildren, the previous night, had been on their way to their grandmother's house. As they turned off from the main highway to the old highway, where there is a sharp left-hand curve in the road about 50 yards in, they saw the being. It was right at the curve where they saw it crossing in front of their vehicle, a very large, hairy, long-armed figure. As we all sat and listened to this, and every one of us believed them, L.S., a son-in-law, suggested that we all go look for signs at the site where this occurred. L is an Eskimo from Alaska, and he is a hunter. I wanted to go, but I was still in my pajamas and robe, so I told them to go without me. When I got there, they were gone, so I returned back to the house. When they returned, Lewis said that there was droppings, tracks, and matted down grasses, and chicken feathers but no sign of bones or other scraps. His view of the droppings, as related to me then, is that they don't belong to a bear or any other animal he knows of. 
They contained seeds and plant materials and bore a resemblance to human feces, except for size and quantity. Before we got to Mescalero in early August, someone said she woke up early in the morning and noticed a huge handprint on her dining room window, which is a large window beneath which the table sits. She went outside to clean it off so the grandkids and others wouldn't see it and be scared. Grandma is proud of her flower garden and lilies, and she said the flowers were trampled down by something heavy. Again, there were no horses around. In the kitchen on August 24th, I was told that the howls and screams occur pretty frequently at night, and they have all heard them and can't really identify them. They all remarked about the bad odors they have smelled on nights when the dogs, which are all tied up, have barked and barked. One of the granddaughters was sitting in the living room one night, watching TV, when she happened to look out the window to see something looking back at her. All she could say was that it was big and hairy. The family advises that these strange sounds and occurrences began in their area about November 1996. They told me that easy access to the river is why there are sightings. I was told that a mountain lion made his her home on the ridge across the house, but since these noises and sightings have happened, there is no sign of the cougar anymore. On September 1st to 15th, 1998, in the summer of 1998, during the September elk hunt, I had an experience while stalking for elk with a hunter buddy of mine. I had the feeling something was near, but I couldn't tell what. I stopped and waited for a while, but nothing. When we started to walk again, we heard a very loud and very low growl, and I mean a loud and low growl nearby. I have been hunting for a long time now, and I have been in the wilderness since I was a boy, and I have never heard anything like this. It scared my partner very much, and since I was the only one armed with a firearm, he did not leave my side for the rest of the day. I had an idea of what it was, but I kept it to myself, and I didn't want to scare my friend even more. I told him it was just a bull in heat, as there was cattle all throughout the area. He kind of believed me, and when we got back to camp, we kept the encounter to ourselves. A few other things happened that week. The next day, we found a bear hunting dog in camp, and he was very scared of something and very hungry. We tried to get a hold of him to check his collar, but he would have nothing of it. He would stay close to camp, but not close enough to get him, and finally, we had to leave him there. One of the witnesses was my hunting buddy. A hunting dog was found and some strange-looking elk rubs. It was early morning at 8.30 a.m. It was bright and sunny. I kept my eyes and ears open, but some of the elk rubs did not look right. Not till a couple of years later did I connect what I was seeing. Some of them were tree twists, not scrapes like an elk would do. Reading some books I have read, they say that Sasquatch marked their territory this way. In 2000, I was deer hunting this time with most of the same people, not in the same area. While sitting around the fire, I did just happen to say something about Bigfoot. Some of them laughed, and some did not, so I took a chance and I told them about the 1998 hunting trip. That night, I found out, the night before I got there, the hunting party heard several loud screams and moans from the hills nearby. It scared them enough that they all armed themselves. Some of them to this day do not believe, but I have played a recording of Sasquatch sounds for some of them, and they say that was it. I know that New Mexico would not seem like Bigfoot country. Most people think it is all desert, but it isn't. We have one of the largest elk populations in the country, and lately, there's been more sightings. Where I heard the growl is not far from the Colorado border, and there's two other sightings in southern Rudoso, which has a large elk herd. I know what I heard, and it was not anything I have heard before. Not a bear, or a big cat, or a bull. It almost sounded human, and it was very powerful. It thrilled me and scared me at the same time, but I know it is real and out there, and to think otherwise would not be sensible. On November 2nd, 1998, in Rio Arriba County in New Mexico, here's a little background about the events that led up to my encounter. I was preparing for a fall elk hunt in north central New Mexico. I had gathered together a pile of clothing for a donation to my favorite local charity. 
On the Wednesday before I was to leave on my hunting trip, I had taken this pile of clothes into my garage and was going to place them on a shelf to be delivered to the charity as soon as I returned from the hunting trip. I had just started to lean over my ATV when I wrenched my back. I was in the worst pain that I had ever experienced. I crawled back into the house and climbed into bed. After about a day and a half's bed rest, I was eager to go hunting, though my back was still in great pain. I somehow managed the three-hour trip to our regular hunting area. After arriving to the campsite, my brother, my cousin, and myself downloaded the three ATVs that we would be using on our hunt. This turned out to be a huge mistake on my part, as I aggravated my already sore back. We sacked out for the night. In the morning, we got up at about 5 a.m. We rode up into the area that we would be hunting and separated. My brother and I were going to stay on a traditionally productive fence line. Since my back was hurting from the ride up, my brother suggested that I take a stand and rest my back. I accepted his advice and took a stand near the clearing with a few good lanes. The weather, although clear and sunny, provided quite a chill. It wasn't long before the cold weather caused my back to tighten up. I was in excruciating pain. My first thought was to get into the nearest clearing where I could get the sun to shine on me and perhaps relieve the shivers. It was at this time that I decided that relief was a little more important than the prospect of bagging an elk. I literally crawled about 50 yards to the nearest clearing and leaned myself against a tree stump that stood no more than 20 inches above the ground. As I had hoped, the sun had provided enough heat to stop the shivers. I was still pretty much immobile, but the shivers were gone. As you can imagine, I was so focused on the pain in my back that I didn't pay too much attention to my surroundings. It was about 9 a.m. at this point. As I was laying there, I kept hearing what I thought was a group of squirrels running up and down the forest pines nearest to me. I tried to lay as still as possible, but due to the pain in my back, my emotions were jerky to say the least. I had my back to the sounds that I thought were being created by scampering squirrels, but as my jerky motions forced me to work my way to the directions of the sounds, I caught a glimpse of a softball-sized rock bouncing off of the trees. At first, I was a bit stunned. And then I recalled some old folklore that referred to rock throwing as a trademark of the Sasquatch. Suddenly, the realization hit me that in my condition of back pain, there was no way that I would be able to defend myself in a confrontation. I tried to rationalize these flying rocks but the thought of a hunter trying to scare game out of a relatively open clearing just did not jive. Besides, there was no way that even a pretty physically fit man could heave rocks of this size with a force that I would describe as dangerous, if the rock was to have hit a person. I would have to say that the rocks were being thrown at intervals of less than one minute. At this time, I was really starting to worry, and I was scared. Besides the sounds of the rocks bouncing off the trees and hitting the ground, there was absolutely no noise. Well, the beating of my heart was pretty loud in my chest. I decided that something was really not right. I called my brother on our two-way radios. He was about 500 or 600 yards away. By this time, the rock throwing had been going on for at least an hour and 10 minutes. My brother arrived and saw the rocks as they bounced off the trees and landed one by one just yards away from where we were huddled. If he hadn't seen and experienced the same thing I was, I would wonder if the whole experience was a hallucination. We talked about this strange event for a few minutes and we glassed the tree line for any sign of what we concluded could only be a creature. My brother and I had witnessed this together for about 30 minutes after he got there. To this day, I have pondered what might have thrown those stones. The only two possibilities, other than a Bigfoot, would have been possibly a bear or another hunter. But based on the size of the rocks being thrown, the velocity, and the length of time that they were being thrown for, it seems unlikely that either of those two possibilities are in fact true. My brother and I are both experienced woodsmen and have hunted that area for a number of years. I have spent a great deal of time reading quality Bigfoot websites. The thing that strikes me as particular is the pattern of stories in which the witness claims silence. These creatures seem to have the ability to move through the forests without making a great deal of noise. 
That is one other factor that makes me believe that my rock throwing experience was an interaction with something that is not yet known to science. Here are two more bits of information that may be of interest. First, the rocks were exiting the trees at about eight feet off the ground. They were being thrown with pretty extraordinary force. Second, the terrain was relatively rocky. After the rocks stopped flying, my brother and myself ventured towards where we thought the rocks were coming from, in search of whatever track or signs we could find. But due to the rocky nature of the terrain, we were unable to find a trace. There was an eerie silence. There were no signs of animals as I recall. Just silence prior to and after the rock throwing. In November 1987, in Otero County in New Mexico. I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact date. Me and a distant cousin of mine had something strange happen to us near Mescalero. It was very early in the morning, maybe just after sunrise. We had to work at the Inn of the Mountain Gods, the casino golf resort on the Mescalero Reservation. No one wanted to give us a ride to work, so we decided to walk to the main highway and hitchhike. This happened in an area where my father lives. From my father's house to the paved road is a distance about maybe half a mile. We finally got to the road and maybe walked another quarter mile when we started hearing noises from across the road at the tree line. Prior to this, I can't remember when, I had heard something similar when I had gone outside to hang clothes. It was just before sunset and I heard something scream. It scared the living daylights out of me and I just ran inside. I had been home alone, and I couldn't wait for my father to come home so I could tell him. When I finally did tell him, he told me it was probably an elk. I didn't believe that for one minute, because this thing was very high-pitched. Anyways, I was telling BB about this incident, that it kind of sounded like that time that I heard something before. All I know is that it really scared us. I have walked that road before, even at night by myself, and I have never been scared like that. We also noticed that whatever it was, it sounded like it was following us on the tree line. Because when we stopped, it stopped. And at one point, we started running, and it seemed to run along with us. That's when we got really scared, because we could hear the branches snapping. We didn't know what to do, because we were so scared. And there wasn't really any houses nearby to run to, so we were half walking, running, and trying to decide if we should go back to my dad's or just keep going when a truck came from behind. We waved those people down and jumped in. I don't even think we waited for them to ask if we wanted a ride. I don't know what this thing could have been. All I know is that it was making some really scary noises, and it seemed to be following us. You hear stories now and then about Bigfoots in the area. My dad has heard stories. I know when my children go to visit him, he rarely ever lets them play outside. He says it's because of bears, but I think it's something else. He just doesn't want to say. In summer 1996, at the Four Corners area of New Mexico and Colorado in San Juan County in New Mexico, a large something walks along the San Juan River. It goes on to the Navajo Reservation. It has been seen even by our local sheriff. It is a large, brownish-red, hairy thing. It stinks to high heaven and makes god-awful noises. We usually know it's outside when the dogs start howling. We live about an eighth of a mile from the river. It usually shows up every three to five years. We don't go down to the river as everyone knows it's down there. I had also heard something messing around in the shed, went out there, and this thing was in there looking around. It was about seven foot or taller. Russian olive forest follows the river. The river comes from Colorado, and we live in the high desert plateau region. In May 1983, out of the town of Cuba, about seven miles into the Santa Fe National Forest in Rio Arriba County in New Mexico. It was on an access road to a public campground, larger one, number 126. I experienced a most peculiar visitation. I was 30 years old at the time and a trade school student in Albuquerque, machine drafting. We were camping fairly high up in the mountains on an alcohol-free student activity prior to the end of the school year. 
Early that morning, at around 4 a.m., I was asleep in my own tent, alone, when I was actually awakened by an awful stench. This foul odor was so powerful that the scent actually burnt my nostrils. I sat up in my sleeping bag just in time to see a massive, light brown hairy arm reach into the tent through the front flap and start to feel around. Totally horrified, I started to hyperventilate, as this huge arm clearly was not human. Just as I was about to scream my lungs out, the arm drew back and out of the tent. I was strangely aware then that there were two creatures right outside of my tent, as I heard two separate and distinct vocalizations, one male and one female. Through the dim outside light and through the tent material, I could make out at least two figures, possibly eight feet in height. The next thing I heard were those two beings yelling loudly as they apparently ran away from my tent. I stayed awake until sunrise and I was so enthralled by what had happened that I could not bring myself to tell anyone about it. And at breakfast, no one else was there talking about any similar occurrence. In July 1995, about five minutes from Cloudcroft in New Mexico, me and my friend Edgar had pitched a tent. At about one in the morning, we were awakened by a scream that was coming from far away. The sound kept getting closer and closer. We kept trying to figure out what animal was making those noises. We were too scared to look out, so we just stayed quiet inside the tent. We could hear that the animal was looking for food because it was making stops at each of the camping spots. It sounded awful. It was like a screaming baby or screaming woman. In between each scream, you could also hear some grunts. Eventually, it reached our camping spot. I could hear that it was looking around, and it left. It continued the screaming until it faded in the distance. The following morning, we had asked the camp manager if she had heard anything during the night, and they said no. When we told them what we heard, they dismissed it as a cougar. Since we are not experienced campers, we believed them and left it at that until I heard recordings on a web page. The sounds were almost identical to those on the recordings. The recording sounds were from far away, and we heard it within a few feet, but they sounded the same. At Battle Mountain in Lander County in Nevada on August 6th, 1999. On the above date, Battle Mountain exploded into several simultaneously range fires in what would have been known as the Battle Mountain Complex Fire. A Bigfoot was supposedly injured in the fire, according to an anonymous government employee who alerted the BFRO. In a letter to the BFRO dated the 7th of August, 1999, the anonymous government employee states, I observed an animal wounded by fire moving on all fours, not like a bear, more like an ape. Firefighters captured the animal, contacted a local vet and medical doctor. The U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of Interior, and Bureau of Land Management on the scene. The animal was tranquilized and moved to an unknown location. Those at the scene told not to talk about what they saw. The animal was approximately seven and a half feet long tall, human-like arms and legs, face not like a man or ape, but mixed between genitalia, male, uncircumcised, and human-like, hair covering most of its body except its chest. Its chest had hair, but it was sparse. Hands with sparse hair, palms were bare, with five digits and human opposition of thumb and a fifth digit. Speech, attempted to communicate with caregivers once it realized that they were attempting to care for it. Multiple burns on hands, feet, legs, and body, some second and third degree burns, Using rules of nine, approximately 45% of his body had burns. Doctor and vet were working together providing care and moved it to an unknown location locally. This notice given in violation of orders given by BLM, DOI, and DFAND, and W witnesses numbered on the area of 30 to 25. Word is out in the government and among the firefighters since an MD was called out. Many thought a firefighter was injured. Please note that I am a government employee of one of the listed agencies fighting brush fires in the wilderness area of Nevada. Large-scale fire, approximately 70,000 acres burned. 
and I'm under orders not to disclose information. I believe a cover-up is in the making. People need to know. The animal needs to be kept alive and studied and released in a protected area. The incident happened in the early afternoon. About 20 firefighters were directly involved. The injured patient apparently wandered within sight of the fire crew and then was surrounded. The patient seemed to know that he was captured because he soon gave up. The patient sat down, giving no evidence of a will to resist. The patient was laid out on the ground at first. His injuries were rather serious, including burns to the hands, feet, legs, and trunk, as well as a lot of singed hair. It didn't take long for the medical services to get to the scene. The attending medical team included a regular MD for the fire crews, a vet, and one or more paramedics. The vet was taken aback at working on the creature, so human-like, and he is reported to have allowed the physician to do most of the work. At some point, Demerol and morphine were administered. The patient was placed on a spine board, which was too small. He was then placed on a regular ambulance stretcher. The sides were left down because part of the body hung over too far. The feet hung off the end. A cutdown was performed to obtain an intravenous line, and fluids were administered. During the treatment of his wounds and the efforts of life support, the patient communicated with moans, groans, and grumbling. Bowel sounds were heard by several who were standing close to the creature. No language-like vocalizations were heard. The patient responded to touch, specifically patting and stroking to calm him. Two or three times the patient was observed to have been especially responsive to a young Native American woman who started ministering to him right from the very beginning. The patient was removed from the scene in the back of a utility truck, not an ambulance. The total time from the initial sighting to extraction was estimated at three hours. There was no urination, defecation, or vomit at the scene. The patient did not eat anything during that time. Serum and blood were leaking from the burned areas of the body. The area of the arm on which the cutdown was performed was shaved. The hair probably fell to the ground. There was significant blood from the cutdown site and from the subsequent insertion of a venous line and some of that blood dripped to the ground. No one knows where the patient was taken. No video cameras were on the scene to film the aspect of the incident. The fire commander was present. He had a camera, but he did not record what he saw. The being was described as about seven feet tall, with most of his body covered by brownish hair, about two inches in length. No gray hairs were evident. There was an odor about the patient, very hard to describe, only that it was natural. The head was not sloped, and the forehead was very heavy-boned. The lips were large, but human-like, and tight to the head, with the earlobe attached, not dangling. The head was about two times the size of a human head. There was hair on the face, but not on the palms or soles of the feet. On September 15, 1980, in Story County in Nevada, I was a reserve deputy sheriff, for Story Co. Sheriff's Office. I was employed by the Houston International Minerals Corporation at Gold Hill as their on-site security supervisor. I had worked the day shift. I had ran some kids out of the old mill at around 3.30 p.m. I was showing my swing shift officer the area that I had ran the kids off from. We were in the security vehicle parked on the high side of the south side of the old mill. We saw that the boys, four of them, were running back down the ravine to the creek below. It was 4.15 p.m. As the boys reached the creek, they must have scared a group of girls at the creek bottom because they started screaming. There was a lot of noise being made by both the girls and boys laughing and yelling. At first I thought they had scared a deer west of them near the rock outcrops. Then I thought, no, it's too big to be a deer. I could see it moving among the trees, heading up the other side of the ravine at a very fast pace. I thought it must be a lone Mustang as I watched. The security officer got the binoculars from the seat and said, oh my god. I looked closer and I realized it was not a Mustang. I was looking at a very large, graying brown man-shaped thing, about 10 plus feet tall. It was obviously male because of its build. As it cleared the trees near the top of the hill, I could clearly see it. It was covered with hair from head to toe, graying like a person in their fifties. 
It was at least three feet across at the shoulders. At the crest of the hill, it turned to look back down the ravine. It was maybe a hundred yards across the ravine. I had an unobstructed view at this point. It stood at the top of the hill, maybe a minute, looking down at the hill, and then it turned and moved to the other side of the hill out of view. We drove over to where we had seen the thing last, about a two-mile drive on dirt roads. It was approximately 4.50 p.m. by then. We saw no further sign of it, but was able to establish that the thing was standing next to a tree that was 11 feet tall, and it was just as tall as the tree that we saw. The only other thing that I noticed was just the noise of the kids down lower on the creek, happy sounds, not fear, screaming and yelling. In mid-September 1984, in Douglas County in Nevada, my friend and I were hiking on the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range above Lake Tahoe in the Carson Valley above the town Genoa. Both of us grew up in this area. Although in high school I was kind of a cut-up, my friend Linda graduated valedictorian of our class five years earlier. She was very logical. We have often hiked this trail that basically goes straight up the mountain and over to Tahoe. It was a strenuous hike. When we parked our truck at the trailhead, there was another car parked there as well. We were a quarter way up the trail when two teenage boys came running down the mountain towards us. The trail was extremely steep, and they were running for all they were worth. They stopped long enough to implore us not to go up any further up the mountain, as they had seen a monster or something. There was an old deer hunter's cabin at about the halfway point, and we told the boys that we were only going to go that far. We thought they were drinking or on drugs. We shrugged off the incident and laughed and joked that we wish we had what they were smoking. We reached the cabin without incident and sat down on the bluff that overlooked Carson Valley. We split a soda that we had brought, and I took out my recorder, a flute-like instrument, and began playing some little tunes on it. We were alone on the mountain, we thought. After about an hour of putzing around, we decided to head back down the trail. I kept smelling dog dew, or something dead. I even checked my shoes. We were near the creek, gathering pine cones for an art project. I was facing downhill, and Linda was facing uphill. We were examining a particularly perfect cone, when Linda looked up and exclaimed, Oh my god, it's a bear. No, it's a guy in a bear suit. I looked up, and I couldn't believe it. We were a stone toss from a seven-foot hairy dude. He looked directly at us, and to this day, Linda and I felt something pass between the three of us. He stood across the creek from us. His hair was the color of dry pine needles and covered his whole body with the hair, thinning just on his chest and face. He had a large, broad chest, but not breasts like a female. His arms were hanging at his sides, nearly to his knees, and when he walked, he took long strides and his arms swung freely as he walked. He didn't seem to fear us, although he began to walk straight up a pine needle-covered slope, barefooted, without slipping. As he moved away, Linda grabbed my arm and began dragging me down the hill. I couldn't take my eyes off of him, and he never took his eyes off of us. I do not feel to this day that he meant to harm us, but instead I feel he was just fascinated with us, as we were with him. His face seemed almost serene, with very intelligent eyes, and his face resembled an orangutan. He had large eyes and a flattish nose. I sketched a picture as soon as I got home, and Linda confirmed that I had captured his likeness. I wish I had a camera on me that day. As we continued at a fast pace down the hill, he remained on the ridge above us, paralleling in the same direction. We reached our truck and could still see him crouching on the granite boulder at least a football field distance between us. I yelled up to him that he was very cool, but he shouldn't be scaring the crap out of us locals. He stood up on his boulder, and Linda told me to shut up and get in the truck. We were strangely disturbed that afternoon and evening. We thought of going to the Forest Service or Sheriff's Department, but criminy sakes, who would have believed us? Plus, in our community, they would just want to shoot him. We have since hiked there many times, always hoping to catch another glimpse. We are married ladies with kids, and we take the kids up Bigfoot Canyon, periodically, in search of our elusive friend. A few years ago, the wind blew down some trees during a storm and exposed an area that we had not seen from the trail before. 
When we went up to investigate, we found a large boulder and some older pine trees with branches low to the ground around it. You could duck down and go under the trees, near the wall of the boulder, and it looked as if something or someone had made a natural shelter there. The pine needles had all been trampled down, and it seemed to be away from the prevailing winds. A great place for deer, bear, or perhaps a Bigfoot. We hope so. I will never look at life on this earth the same way. I have seen Bigfoot, and not only does it make for a great tale around campfires, it fuels my imagination about every little sound I hear when I'm in the wilderness. I am so intrigued. I only hope that no harm comes to the Bigfoots. I believe that the great creator of all life shares the sight of the Bigfoot with people who might grow from the experience. I know Linda and I have both grown. Even if we share the experience with someone who doesn't believe us, it really doesn't matter. We know what we saw. He was so close in proximity that it was obvious to us that this fella belonged here. He was as natural as the sky, creek, trees, and the deer. I spoke with an Austrian mountain biker who had a strange experience five years ago, directly on the other side of the mountain on the Tahoe side. He said he was riding his bike and exercising his German shepherd. He said he kept smelling something dead. He said his dog was running ahead of him, and then suddenly his dog yelped and turned around without waiting for him and ran back down the mountain. The man said that he never did see anything, but he felt there was someone watching him, and he said the hair on his neck and arms prickled. He thought maybe it was a bear, but the smell kept coming back to him. This story was shared with me before I had told him my own. In 1879, two hunters were chased by a wild man in the Antelope Mountains in Nevada. This was one week before November 8, 1879. Peter Simmons and John Gore had been out all day hunting ducks, and as evening came, they took a short cut across the mountains on their way back to the ranch. As they were slowly picking their way around the edge of a large chasm, they heard a slight noise near a rugged cliff and saw a huge, hairy object, apparently half man and half beast spring from behind a cliff and start for the other side of the mountain, running with the speed of the wind. Mistaking it for a wild animal, Gore fired at it. The shot appeared to take effect in the arm, for with a scream of pain, the creature halted, tapped the wound, and turning, chased its pursuers, who with empty guns in hand, dared not measure strength with such a foe. Dropping their guns, both sought safety in flight, and stopped only when compelled to do so from the lack of ability to run further. The men stated that it resembled a man in general appearance, and was wild-eyed and very fierce in its disposition. The creature's arms were long and hairy, and it looked very much like a full-grown gorilla. It ran with remarkable swiftness, all the time uttering loud cries, as though in pain and enraged. In October 1994, in Douglas County, Nevada. I did not see anything because it was pitch black that night. Being stranded, tired, and miles from help added to the terror to the ordeal. But I was of sound mind and positive of what happened. I never saw anything because of the darkness. It's what I heard that's important. I was 18 miles off Highway 395, cutting firewood for the upcoming winter. I was driving down a logging road when a piece of brush tore out my transmission line. I had no choice but to walk out. After walking eight miles, it was dark. This is when I encountered a large, screaming animal walking towards me breaking trees. When I heard the scream, I was so startled that I jumped two feet in the air. I never go into the mountains unarmed. I was carrying a 30-round SKS. I could hear this beast was extremely angry and coming straight at me. I threw the safety off my rifle and fired 10 rounds overhead where the creature was making his noise, which would have been 50 yards to the south of me. It stopped its advance towards me, and then it started to move the opposite direction uphill, all while screaming and breaking trees along the way, until it crested a large hill. I continued my walk to town, thinking to myself, what would have been the outcome had I not been armed? My family, who had been searching for me since dark, they eventually picked me up. After speaking with some elders in the tribe, they informed me the creature could have either been Bigfoot or Hanawewe. One rainy night in 1983, 
a motorcyclist, was traveling near Las Vegas in Clark County. His headlight hit an animal which was standing upright on its hind legs. It turned and looked at him as he approached, and then turned and ran off the road, still upright. He knew for sure it was not a bear. The animal ran hunched over and had long straight hair all over its body as well as its face. It was approximately seven feet tall. On the 23rd of January, 1980, a workman whilst driving in the desolate nuclear testing ground saw a dark, hairy, six to seven foot tall Bigfoot walk across the road and into the sagebrush. No tracks were found. Department of Energy spokesman Dave Jackson said a worker saw the creature walk across the road in the forward area of the test site. It was reported heading east towards the Yucca Flat, a site of numerous above and below ground nuclear tests. The creature was described as more than six feet tall, covered with hair and walking upright, taking long strides like a man. Jackson said when the unidentified worker reported the sighting, he took quite a bit of ribbing. Jackson said security officials stationed in Mercury investigated, but were unable to find any footprints or other evidence. If you enjoy our content, please be sure to subscribe to our channel, like and comment down below, and follow us on social media. The links are in the description of this video and on our channel page. Also, if you've had an encounter and would like your story told here, please email us at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. As always, we look forward to hearing from you, and thank you for listening.